So I'm delighted to be here amongst all of you today. Am I audible to you behind, or is it a little soft? You can hear. Okay, good. Thank you. So I'll speak today on three parts. Basically, I'll talk about the nature of the outer world, nature of the inner world, and how we can harmonize these two natures to live a purposeful and joyful life. <coughs> Broadly, we can see that in the world, there are two kinds of people. Some are wise and some are otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> and not only that, actually rather thinking of these as two distinct categories. Now, we are ourselves sometimes wise and sometimes what? Otherwise. Otherwise. <laughs> yeah. So, sometimes when we are speaking with someone, especially if we are analyzing something or giving some advice to someone, you might feel hey, this is so clever, this is so insightful. So, we might ourselves catch ourselves when we are particularly insightful. But there sometimes in retrospect, we look back and think, why did I do such a stupid thing? How could I have been so dumb? So, sometimes we are otherwise. So, why this oscillation happens within us itself is because of the nature of the outer world and the nature of the inner world. So, let me talk about the nature of the outer world first. I will speak based on the ancient yoga text, the Bhagavad Gita, which describes uh, the paradoxical nature of things in the outer world. That the search for pleasure is often the cause of the greatest trouble. The search for pleasure is often the cause of the greatest trouble. We could start from extreme examples. Say, somebody become, somebody starts uh, developing some unhealthy addictive habit, say like smoking or drinking or taking drugs. Now, it said with respect to drinking, first the drinker takes the drink, then the drink takes the drink <laughs> and then the drink takes the drinker. So, it grows. So, nobody ever desires to become an addict. They desire just to have a good time, just to have fun, just to feel good, just to go high. So, whenever we do anything, it is for the purpose of getting pleasure. We start with the search for pleasure. But often, the search for pleasure is what gets us into trouble. It ends in trouble. Addiction is a simple example of this, but this principle can apply at various levels, wherein we might <coughs> end up, you now we eat for pleasure, but then we keep eating, keep eating, keep eating and then our body balloons out and then we feel angry with ourselves and then we feel miserable. So, the search for pleasure is often the cause of the greatest trouble and the Gita, I will use this the short name for referring to this yoga text, it explains this in a very interesting way. It says that that which tastes like nectar in the beginning will taste like poison in the end. So, this is the nature of the outer world that many of the things that appear enjoyable, they end up becoming troublesome. It is like nectar in the beginning, but after some time it becomes trouble. And the Gita also has another verse which says that there is another kind of happiness which is like poison in the beginning, but nectar in the end. Poison in the beginning. Now, as was mentioned in the introduction, I am a writer and sometimes I encourage or guide or mentor people to write. Other spiritualists who also want to share spirituality through their writing. If I am too soft, please feel free to let me know, because while speaking sometimes my voice softens. 
you could just raise your hands and uh, I'll be alerted that I'm too going to soft. Is that okay? You have been able to hear easily, no difficulty till now. Okay. Thank you. So sometimes when you are writing, so I was just recently talking with uh, one young boy and I was explaining how his thought flow was not proper, his logic was not proper, his grammar was not so good. I want, genuinely wanted him to help. So, uh, wanted to help him to become a better writer and he has told me, you know, you just do not get my style. So, when he said this, I initially felt like laughing. There is, yes, certainly everybody wants to develop their own style. But, suppose we want to build a stylish building. Mm -hmm. A very artistic building. We want to maybe want to have an angular arch and uh, uh, maybe maybe particular pentagonal windows and all kinds of artistic things we want to do. We can display all our artistry in the superstructure of the building. But the foundation of the building has to be according to sound engineering principles. If I start if my building has no foundation or if I try to use all kind of artistic designs in the foundation and the foundation does not have any strength then the whole building will collapse. So, in writing there is the craft of writing and there is the art of writing and this applies to every field you could be music, you could have art. So, the craft is like the foundation. If somebody does not learn the basic uh, spellings of words the basic punctuation, the basic rules of grammar and then they write something and they say this is my style. Well, this is not, this is not the style of writing, this is simply the style of laziness. So, there has to be some application initially, so that one can develop the craft and once the craft is developed, then you can bring about your artistry then people can have dazzling turns of phrases, people have can stimulating metaphors, people have can alliterations and you can do all kinds of things which can make the speech sparkle. But first one has to have the discipline of getting the craft right. If we had to get the try to get to the art without the craft, it is like building the superstructure without the foundation, a small storm and everything will fall. So, similarly, now, in the, now getting the craft right is not particularly enjoyable. I talk with many students and adults also, I ask them how many of you enjoyed studying English grammar? Anyone? Really loud? <laughs> yeah, I know many people who love studying English grammar and there is one reason for it it helps them find faults in others English grammar. <laughs> it may not be like that for you, but generally those who love grammar, it is not very grammar common. Sometimes people feel, oh this spelling is wrong, this pronunciation is wrong, this rule is there. Grammar seems to be like a burden, but once you get the grammar right, then when one starts writing, it just becomes uh, at least structurally sound and then it can become artistically fluent also. So, learning the craft is like, it is not very pleasurable. So, the Bhagavad Gita says there is another kind of pleasure which is like poison in the beginning, but nectar in the end. Mm -hmm. So, maybe in any field, if you want to learn a particular field, learn any skill which is worthwhile, which is going to lead to any tangible achievement in life, learning it requires application, requires discipline, requires dedicated effort and that can be like poison in the beginning. But once it is learned, then one expresses oneself. See somebody does not even know the basic notes of a, say a piano and they want to express themselves. Well okay, they will express, but what they will express will not their best self, it will probably be their worst self. So, there is in any worthwhile area in life, 
there first we have the poison and then we have the nectar. Same applies to relationships for example. Initially in relationships there might be the initial attraction, infatuation. But once one gets down, if one wants to have a serious relationship, it requires commitment. And that commitment can seem like a poison. Uh, my one of my friends is a marriage counselor, and he said that there are only two kinds of couples. The first is those who quarrel with each other, and the other is those whom you don't know very well. <laughs> those whom you don't know very well. So when two people are together, okay. Okay. <coughs> Better keep it a little closer. So, when two people are together, is it better? Not much. Okay. Okay. So, there will be a phase of poison, but if they stay committed together, then there comes nectar afterwards. So, broadly speaking, have you got it ready? Yeah, yeah, sure. So this is a small diagram which illustrates this point that yeah, is it talking about this? Yes. So we have poison in the beginning and nectar in the end. Any kind of joy which leads to growth, the P is this is not P and diodes in electronics. This is. P is poison and is nectar. So, that which tastes like poison in the beginning will taste like nectar in the end. That is uh, enlightened happiness. That is the kind of joy which will help us grow, which will help us learn something, which will help us to contribute something. The other kind of joy is that which is nectar in the beginning but poison in the end, like say addiction. So, now all of us are searching for pleasure and in general, when we go towards go towards the joy that is poison in the beginning nectar in the end we end up becoming that is wise but when you go towards that joy which is nectar in the beginning poison in the end we end up becoming otherwise so we oscillate between the two because of the nature of pleasures in the world. Now, this is a broad division, not every pleasure will neatly fit in these two categories, but you could see that everything that we do in life has broad characteristics like these. So, this is the first point I was going to make that we have, we are often deluded by the nature of the world outside of us. So, each after each point, I would like to have a short reflection any point that struck you, any point that uh, you found stimulating or something which you would like to share with someone else when you go from here. We will we'll have some reflection at the end also, but right now any reflections? Yes. For example, like some people find it like very stressful when they are studying, but you know they are trying to pursue going to like either medical school or dental school, so then it can feel like poison, right, studying all the time, but then your rewards are pay off. Excellent example, yeah, thank you. Yeah, studying can be like poison initially, but once we get into a promising career, that's like nectar. Yeah, thank you. Yeah? Human value has an inherent purpose. Human? Human, like human pleasure has an inherent purpose. Uh, what do you mean by human pleasure? No, what do you mean by human pleasure? That's what I'm asking. What? How do you define human pleasures? What? What will you call well, as you? What makes you happy immediately? So you mean human pleasures mean like food and things like that, or what yeah. would you? Does that have value? Okay, certainly. Do human pleasures have value? Have value? Of course. You could say at one level, nothing in the world is valueless. Human pleasures definitely have value. In general say when we eat food, it gives pleasure and it is not just the mitigation of hunger. That is of course, you could say a pleasure that is more a removal of pain, but if the food tastes good, 
that's also a joy and a large part of human culture is preparing delicious foods you go, i travel across the world and every country has such amazing cuisines so it is naturally a part of human life and same we can say for music for art for entertainment for sports all of them have their place the problem comes when we start pursuing them obsessively all of us were unicellular organisms at one time inside our mother's womb now millions of cells in our body so growth is what has resulted in this transformation and growth is natural but cancer is also growth our cancer is disproportionate and destructive growth and that growth destroys the rest of the body so similarly the human pleasures if we start making them the exclusive purpose of life say if somebody just lives to eat then their food instead of giving them life will eventually take their life similarly entertainment is a part of life but if people become obsessive with entertain obsessed with entertainment so the human pleasures if they are proportionate to a holistic purposeful human life then they do have a place they add to the flavor of life but if they become the exclusive purpose of life then they eventually make our life valueless and they may even make us lifeless make take our lives does it answer your question thank you so let's move on to the second uh, second word what is the first point i spoke till now broadly did you remember pain in the beginning and nectar in the end nectar. yeah i spoke about the nature of the outer world now the second point is going to be inner the nature of the inner world yeah do you have it ready okay so here you can see the soul uh, you have i think you studied in the previous sessions about the soul intelligence mind isn't it how many of you have been there for the previous sessions okay how many of you for the, the first session okay fine so the inner world what is there now whatever is there we psychologists across the world are unanimous in acknowledging that we are not the masters in our own house that there are some forces within us which seem to act on their own even against our will so inside us is something quite complex and there are different conceptions for analyzing what is inside us so the gita offers us a three level model of the self where there is the physical world that is outside then there is the there is the you could say inner mental world that is inside and then there is the soul who is the seer so the soul or consciousness is the radiating energy it's like suppose you are watching a on a big screen you are watching something so you are at your home or in your theater you are in a theater you are the seer and then there is a screen and on that screen it could be a movie which is simply imagination or it could be a live broadcast of a match which is do- which is depicting something from far away so that screen is the interface between you and whatever you are seeing out there so our inner world has these two things there is the inner screen and there is the inner seer the inner seer is like the person seeing the movie the inner screen is the interface between the outer world and the inner seer so now in this inner screen there are broadly two forces the mind and the intelligence so the mind broadly refers to the faculty that deals with emotion 
and the intelligence broadly deals to, refers to the faculty that deals with reason now emotion and reason are two tools that we use and both of them are needed for functioning we want to be reasonable we want to be logical but a computer or a artificial intelligent robo can be much more reasonable and logical than us but it has no emotions it has no sentience now if every morning when you turn on your laptop and as soon as you open the laptop the laptop speaks to you i love you <laughs> <laughs> how many of us would take that seriously this is a programmed output there is no emotion over there so there is no consciousness over there and the program it could be changed and say somebody who wants to have some fun at our expense or wants to anger us they could change the program and next day we open the computer and the computer says i hate you <laughs> <laughs> so that's simply programming basically the rational faculty of ours can help us to analyze to calculate to categorize and that's important but at the same time we need the emotional faculty also which helps us to connect which helps us to relate with each other to relate with people so both these faculties are there and both these faculties are resources for the soul the soul is the source of consciousness it says some people are more emotional than rational some people are more rational than emotional broadly speaking this might be divided according to gender but all that's a generalization but the point is that we could say that the the soul is here and in front of it there are these two resources there is the mind which is the is a resource of emotion and the intelligence is the resource of reason and the soul's consciousness comes through these and then it moves outward now in the inner world sometimes the intelligence can be in control of the mind and sometimes the mind can be in the control of the intelligence we want to have emotions but we want to have regulate our emotions if the emotions are not regulated they can make us act impulsively so but if the intelligence is in control that means we use our reason to channel and direct our emotion then what happens you see in this diagram from the soul the consciousness is coming outward to the intelligence to the mind and then when it looks at the outer world at that time it sees beyond the immediate beyond the first appearance so you see in the nature of the world initially there is nectar and in with respect to the ignorant joys and initially there is poison with respect to the enlightened joys but we can look beyond the immediate to the consequence and our motivation to do something depends on what we see suppose say somebody goes for goes for weight training now either they can look at the huge weights i can never lift this or they can look at somebody who has a who has a strong shapely body say i want a body like that i do this it's a simple difference what we see or what we focus on determines our response so if we focus on the effort that is required we feel it's too much if we focus on the result that will be got oh this this worth it so when we look at the weights alone you think effort is too much but we look at somebody who is got a healthy body i want like this so basically our vision determines our motivation and when we are when our intelligence is in control and our mind is subordinated then we don't just look at the appearance we look at the consequence yeah say right like if you're studying for an exam this is so boring this is so exhausting i just don't feel like studying now when you feel like that if you just go along with that feeling we just give up study you no know, but if i do this study i'll get into this college i can get this kind of job i can have this kind of career i can create the kind of life that i want 
when we have that understanding, when we keep that in our consciousness, okay, I will go through it. See, the initial poison remains, but when we, our vision is focused, focused on the eventual nectar, then we get the determination to persevere through the poison. Say, if you are studying for an exam and suddenly you get a notification, your friend has updated their Facebook profile photo. Oh, what photo have they put? Immediately the answer come, let us look at it. And then as compared to the effort of studying, just looking at somebody's photo, it seems, it seems enjoyable. Okay, let me have a break. So, that seems like nectar. Mm, that seems like nectar. But we see, if we see that and we go there and we see one photo, okay, what are the other photos here? <laughs> And look at it, few more photos, few more photos, few more photos, and then hours may go away in that. And then after that, what a fool I am! <laughs> Why do I waste so much time like this? We beat ourselves up and then we are unprepared for the exam and then we do poorly and then we experience the poison. So basically, when the intelligence is in control, then we focus on the consequence and choose wisely. That is when we are wise. So, inside us, what is in control? Is it the mind in control or the intelligence in control? That is very important. Can you go to the next picture? Now, conversely, sometimes, now here if you see the flow is happening from bottom up. So, the soul consciousness is coming first to the mind, then to the intelligence, and then going upwards. When this happens, the intelligence is controlled by the mind. And then if you see what are with the arrows, where are they going? It is going for to the nectar first. It is going, oh, this is so enjoyable. Just some people say, live in the moment, just enjoy right now. Yeah, okay, enjoy right now. But what after the now is over? <laughs> now, we we want to live in the moment, but not live for the moment. You want to live in the moment means live in the present. That means use the present fully, experience it fully, contribute fully in the present. Don't get absent minded about the worried about the pa future or uh, lamenting about the past. Focus in the present. But we live in the present for something bigger than the present. We live in the present for creating a brighter future for ourselves. But when the mind is in control, the mind says, this is what I want and this is what I want right now. Forget everything else. And that, it is so troublesome. Forget it. I do not care for it. And this is where, if the mind comes in control, we go by the immediates and then we lose the ultimate. We lose the eventual things. And children have usually this kind of state. Where the, they are largely their mind is in control. If they like something, they will delight. If they dislike something, they will start crying immediately. So, it is almost all mind. And at that time, it is the parent's intelligence that is important. The parent has to, to some extent, discipline the child. Now, as we grow up, eventually many of you will become parents and you will have your own children. But right now, you have to, in some ways, become your own parent. <coughs> the mind will be impulsive like a child, but the intelligence has to be like an adult. And the essential turbulent turbulence of adolescence, teenage and youth, or you could say early youth, that is this tussle between the mind and the intelligence. And the mind takes control, then we get carried away by the immediates and we squander opportunities for building something ultimate, building something of lasting value. So, our inner world can also work against us. If the mind is in control, then the inner world works against us. And when you talk about spiritual knowledge, it is meant to help us understand both the nature of the outer world and the nature of the inner world. And then we can channel ourselves constructively. That will be my third part. But at this point, the second part was the nature of the inner world. Any reflections or questions?
Anything that struck you, anything that provoked your thought? Yeah, please. It's kind of like um, how you describe the inner world. So say, for example, um, someone's on YouTube constantly just watching, you know, for example, like bad videos every day. What they see through their eyes is coming through their mind. So that's their food. They're like digesting it through their mind's eyes. So that's going to eventually become their inner world. And then say, for example, they go to work from watching those bad YouTube videos all day. And they see themselves around themselves with other people. Well, the other people around me are really happy because I'm not, for example. So is that kind of like, you know, what can happen to them? Or the last point you said, is that kind of? So like, um, that can kind of like, is that kind of a description of the, that person's inner world? Okay, good point, you know. If, if somebody constantly watches YouTube videos and then they go to work and then others are not watching YouTube videos, but they still seem to be happy, still seem going on with their lives. Uh, yeah. yeah, going on with their lives. So, yeah, basically, Every action that we do is not an action in isolation. Every action becomes like an impression in our inner world. And that impression will come as a proposition again. Say if you um, have a phone and on that phone you have visited a particular website. Say if you have visited sports.com repeatedly. And then now you come to a spiritual talk and you want to, okay, so spirituality stuff seems interesting. I want to search what is spirituality. And then you want to go to spirituality.com. <laughs> you type S P and what happens? Sports. Sports come immediately. <laughs> now, why? Because that is the autocomplete based on past choices. <laughs> 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 so, now somebody else who has not visited sports so, of, uh, so often, they type SP, maybe nothing will come, maybe 100 options will come. If somebody has repeatedly visited spirituality before that, as soon as they type SP, spirituality will come. So, each choice that we make on our browser, that choice will reflect back as a autocomplete proposition in future. And the same applies in our mind also. Now, in our inner world, every choice that we make becomes a proposition for the future and if somebody keeps making a choice then it doesn't just come as a proposition it becomes the home page so as soon as you open the browser it immediately opens to the home page so for example somebody is say an addict say somebody is a youtube addict mm. then as soon as the browser of their mind opens as soon as they wake up First thing is pick up the phone and open YouTube. So, uh, somebody who said, uh, so is an alcoholic. The moment they wake up first, the first thing they think of is drinking. Till they want to sleep, the last thing they think of is drinking. So, when something becomes our home page, something becomes the home page of our browser and something unhealthy becomes a home page, that is when we can say a person is addicted. So, of course, addiction is a strong word and it could simply be a compulsion, it could be a habit. But whatever it is, the important thing is, this is whatever hap uh, our mind is like a programmed machine, but it is not just a programmed machine, it is a programmable machine. So, we, whatever way it has been programmed in the past, we can reprogram it. We can reprogram it. Generally, we, if we are going to take some substance into our body, we take it a little seriously. If somebody tells us take a shot of a drug, or take some drink, we will be a bit little serious about it. No, 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 I don't want to take this into my body. I don't know, it may harm me physically. But you know, from the point of view of forming impressions in the mind, what goes in through the eyes is as impactful as what goes in through the tongue or the skin, going to the mouth or the skin. So, although there is no, there may be no physical contact between what we are viewing with our eyes and us like there is with drugs or drinks. But from the mind's perspective, when a choice is made, an impression is formed. So for the mind, whether there is a physical contact or simply a visual contact, makes no difference in forming an impression. And so if certain impressions have been formed, they will come as default propositions for us. So we, we have to become more conscientious to resist them. And that is going to be the last part of my session.
Does that address your point? Uh, yes, yes. Thank you. Any other points? Okay. okay. So now, <coughs> yeah, you want to say something? Okay. So now, suppose the uh, let's start with something simpler to understand this. Say somebody feels that you know people take them for granted, people treat them cheaply, people exploit them. Now, if one person does that, okay, you may feel angry, you may feel betrayed. If another person does that, second person does that, the third person does that, the fourth person does that, then if one person does that, the problem is likely to be, could be with the other person. But if three, four, five people are doing it, then where is the problem likely to be? Nobody wants to admit. <laughs> Actually, it is much more likely the problem is with us. We might say, no, the whole world is filled with filthy people. Well, you might feel that oh, you know, I can avoid taking responsibility for my situation, but it is actually disempowering because if the world is bad, well, good luck about fixing the world. <laughs> Nobody is going to fix the world, isn't it? If something is wrong with me, maybe, you know, uh, maybe I am not assertive enough, maybe I am too naive, maybe I am too gullible, whatever. If the problem is with me, then although it is at one level disheartening to think that the problem could be with me, but although it is disheartening, although it is disheartening to think that the problem is with us, it is also empowering. Because to think that the problem is out with the world, there is no chance of fixing it. Who, who can fix the world? It is just too big. But if the problem is with us, we can fix it. So, why I am talking about this is, the, our context is that, there could be a problem out there, there could be a problem in here. Now, we talk about the outer world and we talk about the inner world. Now, the outer world also has a somewhat deceptive nature. Things which look pleasurable turn out to be troublesome. Things which uh, are actually fulfilling are initially demanding. Now, can this outer world's nature be changed? We can't change it, isn't it? No, you cannot. If you want to have a have a say sharp intelligence, you have to exercise your intelligence. You have to study. You have to analyze. You have to memorize, and then you can have a sharp intelligence. Some people may have a sharp intelligence from birth also, but still they have to hone it. So, uh, the outer world is going to be what it is. What we can do is understand its nature. We can't fix the outer world. We can't change the outer world in such a way that that which is troublesome will appear troublesome. And that which is fulfilling will look attractive. That is not going to happen very easily. So, what we can fix is what our inner world. Now, fixing our inner world would mean that there is the mind and the, intelli the intelligence and the mind. So, which should be in control? The intelligence should be in control. If the I then, we will be able to choose wisely. So, I will talk about three points within this before I conclude, three concepts. I will talk about <coughs> weakness, wickedness and virtuousness. Hmm? So, weakness is something which all of us have. So, so we may decide, I, I just came from Australia about 10 days ago. So, I had done a seminar in Brisbane on burn anger before anger burns you. Hmm? So, then I was talking about this, I suppose somebody makes a resolution. It was quite funny when we, when I actually saw this happening, somebody said, I made a resolution, I am not going to get angry again, not going to get angry. And then what happens? They start getting angry. And then somebody reminds me, hey, you made a resolution, you are not going to get angry. I am not angry. <laughs> <laughs> we become angry about being reminded that we are angry. That is how we make it deluded. So, here, when there is weakness, when we have a weakness or a vulnerability, 
that means that there is a battle going on between the mind and the intelligence but sometimes the mind overpowers the intelligence and then we get angry and then afterwards we realize i shouldn't have done like that i shouldn't have spoken like that i shouldn't have done that so this is weakness hmm? where you get angry uh, because that the mind overpowers the intelligence but then soon we realize hey, this shouldn't i shouldn't have done it now weakness deserves forgiveness if somebody is weak no okay don't hold it against them they're trying but we all have our human weaknesses but different from weakness is wickedness wickedness is not where the mind temporarily overpowers the intelligence but rather the mind completely dominates the intelligence so weakness makes us hot headed whereas wickedness makes us cold blooded those are cold blooded they plan diabolically how to hurt the other person the most i was facilitating a mediation between two people and one of the persons who was trying to have a reconciliation he said i know you are angry with me other person said i am not angry with you anger is an expensive emotion you are not worth it <laughs> now if somebody has such a dismissive derisive attitude reconciliation is very difficult <laughs> when i was in sydney that was the time when the christchurch bombing happened horrible so now that is an example not of weakness but of of what wickedness, wickedness. where somebody in a very cold blooded way plans how to catch people when they are the most vulnerable and systematically massacre them so wickedness is extremely dangerous and then it's nobody is ultimately redeemable but wicked, wicked people to give forgiveness to wickedness is foolishness because they, they have almost like deadened their conscience they're so completely convinced that i am right that they can't be helped so wickedness is where the intelligence has become a completely enslaved by the mind and there is no we all have some kind of inner war within us between our mind and intelligence but for the wicked people there is no inner war because the intelligence has been completely dominated and conquered by the mind and then they use their intelligence to simply fulfill their devilish schemes so somebody is gone to that direction it's it's extremely uh, dangerous that person will do uh, will do reprehensible acts and do it remorselessly whenever anybody want, when if we if somebody is say, addicted and they want to give up their addiction you know as long as they are trying to defend and justify their addiction nobody can help them so if the mind if the intelligence has been completely controlled by the mind where a person doesn't think that they have a need to change doesn't think that they are wrong also then it's almost like they are lost so so we can most of us are not at the level of wickedness but that is something which you have to be aware of we can go in that direction most of us in our inner war we will be somewhere around weakness and this is weakness this is wickedness and this is what third was you want to remember virtuousness. virtuousness so virtuousness is where the intelligence controls the mind so we would like to go from this journey from here somewhere towards virtuousness and this is where our spirituality a spiritual practice can help us so what does spiritual practice mean and what does it do with that i'll conclude this talk in brief so spiritual practice or, or we could talk about two things over here there is there are spiritual there are spiritual principles spiritual insights in spirituality there are two practice there are two aspects to it there is the there is the philosophy and there is the practice so the philosophy is what strengthens the intelligence so when you come for sessions like this 
you deliberate, you contemplate. Okay, this is how things are happening within me. So, <clears throat> generally, if a if a battle is going on between two people, one, the, if say person A wants to win against person B, say two people are having arm wrestling, now A and B are there. Now, if A wants to win over B, one way is that A becomes stronger than B, or you strengthen A. That's one way. The other is you weaken B. So spirituality does both these things. So what our spiritual practice does is that it strengthens our intelligence. Spiritual, uh, rather spiritual philosophy, the more we study this, the more we analyze this, the more we gain these insights, our intelligence becomes stronger. Okay, this is how things are happening. And it is not that just by understanding we will transform. But at least we will understand how we are being overcome. Say if, if from our house repeatedly money is being stolen and we don't even know where the thief is coming from, then we can't stop the robbing. At least, okay, you know, okay, there is a window over there, they break that window and they come from there. Now, that doesn't mean the thief will stop coming, but at least we know what is happening. So, intelligence, when we strengthen it, then we become better equipped to, uh, res to deal with the inner more, inner uh, robbery that happens, the inner sabotaging of ourselves that happens. The second part is weakening the mind. Now weakening the mind means that, uh, not that uh, we give up our emotionality, but rather we channel or cleanse or purify our emotionality. So the mind becomes weaker when it starts experiencing higher pleasure. I repeat this point that the mind becomes weaker in its impulsiveness when it experiences higher pleasure. Just like say if a child is there and a child wants to play with the toys but the mother or the, the parents say study. No, study. Child may cry, no study. And then say a child's name is Tim. Anybody with the name Tim here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So then the mother says, okay, you know how to spell your name? Uh, no. The mother takes it. Put, it. put this T over here. She's got some scrabble or something like that. Put this T over here. Put this I over here. Put this M. This is T I M. This is Tim. Oh, this is Tim. Then when the father comes home or friends come, some relatives come, you know, I know how to spell my name. But it's T-I-M and he's so proud. Now once he experiences the joy, hey, I want to study. I can learn new things. So the mind changes its, uh, the mind gives up its impulsiveness when it experiences higher pleasure. <coughs> so for that, say for example, we had this musical meditation before the session. So meditation mm, and other spiritual practices like that, they give us experience of higher pleasure. And as you start experiencing that higher pleasure and the mind starts saying, hey, you know, I thought that was enjoyable. The mind was looking at the nectar initially. That's what I want. That's what I want. But then the mind says, okay, there's the poison, but there's nectar also. And this nectar is good. So I want this. And gradually, as the mind's impressions start changing. So, like earlier, I gave the example of sports and spirituality. So, presently, our mind will by default give us, shows the initial nectar of ignorant joys. But we persevere in going on in, in the practices of those activities which give us enlightened joy, say, activities like meditation. And by that, Gradually, as the mind's impressions change, then that is what it will become attracted to. So, when this is happening, the, the intelligence, we are trying to strengthen the intelligence and we are weakening the mind, we are weakening the mind's impulsiveness. How? So, by spiritual knowledge, by understanding the philosophy, we strengthen our intelligence by, by uh, getting spiritual experiences, by doing the spiritual practices that give us experiences of higher pleasure, higher joy, we weaken the mind's impulsiveness. And right now the mind may be like this, we are almost on the verge of being defeated. 
by the mind's impulsiveness. But gradually, in this arm wrestling match, the intelligence will start becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. And eventually, we will be able to discipline the mind. And when the mind becomes disciplined, when it can, uh, you back the previous diagram, when we come to this level, where the intelligence is in control, the mind is an aid, then we can become enormously effective in whatever we do. When we focus on doing something, if our mind is not distracting us, then we can focus in a small amount of time, we can understand a lot of things, do a lot of things, and we can become much, much more productive and effective. And our life can become fulfilling. So, by a spiritual understanding and spiritual practice, we can gradually become the masters of our own house. And thereby, we can have a, create a life for ourselves that is filled with achievement and fulfillment. So, I will summarize what I spoke today. I spoke three main points the nature of the outer world, the nature of the inner world and how to channel, how to function effectively by understanding this nature. So, the nature of the outer world, I talked about how most pleasures which catch our eye, they are like nectar in the beginning but poison in the end. Give the example of addictions and uh, more, many other pleasures which are, which are enlightened pleasures, which are uplifting they are like poison in the beginning, nectar in the end, like learning writing. Expressing ourselves artistically through writing is enjoyable, but learning the nitty gritty, the craft can be a pain. Building the foundation of a house is not very fulfilling. When the superstructure comes, that is what is fulfilling. So, <clears throat> the culture around us is filled with showing us the nectar initially of worldly joys or, and that can distract us. Can you go next one? Then we talked about the inner world where there is the mind and the intelligence. So, basically inside us we often experience some kind of tug of war and we are sometimes wise and sometimes otherwise. And that is because where we have these two faculties, the soul is the source of consciousness and mind and intelligence are like resources. So, the intelligence is associated with reason, the mind with emotion. And ideally the intelligence should be in control of the mind and then when it looks outwards, it sees the consequence of actions and therefore it perseveres even when there is poison. Our motivation will be de determined by our vision. If you look at how heavy weights we have to lift, we will feel disheartened. If we look at what kind of physique we can develop by lifting those weights, we will feel enlivened. So, if we look at the eventual nectar that will come in enlightened joys, we will want to perceive it. Look at the initial poison, uh, we will do, we will want to give up. So, when the intelligence is in control, we look at the eventual results and that motivates us. But for us presently, the quite often the mind is in control and that is how we become impulsive and thus we end up sabotaging ourselves. So, when the mind is in control, we get carried away by the immediate. In that, I talked about three things. Weakness is where the mind occasionally overcomes the intelligence. Wickedness is where the mind has completely controlled and dominated the intelligence. And virtuousness is where the intelligence has uh, trained and uh, harmonized with the mind according to its plans. So, you want to go from wherever we are between wicked, weakness and wickedness towards virtuousness. And how do we do that? If there is arm wrestling match between two people, if you want A to win, Either A has to become stronger or B has to become weaker. So, spirituality can help us do both. Spiritual insight, spiritual philosophy helps us understand the nature of the outer and inner world and makes our intelligence strong. And spiritual practices give us experience of higher joy. They take us beyond the initial poison to the nectar. So, meditation <coughs> and other such practices can when, when the child recognizes that, okay, writing is also pleasurable, then the child will be ready to learn writing. Similarly, the mind experiences the joy coming from higher activities, then the mind's impulsiveness weakens. And when the intelligence and the mind can work together constructively, then our focus can become very strong, we can get into a flow 
and with even a little time and attention we can do a lot and thus we can create a life that is filled with both achievement and fulfillment thank you very much So, so should we have some feedback or how do we go ahead? I mean, uh, some reflections or questions or what do we like to do? Does anyone have like a really pressing question on the fourth thing? Then? So normally as we have been doing thr through the semester is at the end of the talk, we just take quick reflections, like any point that you heard that clicked onto you. Um, and we just go through the room. That's like if you just want to pass, you know, um, you want to think more over it, that's fine. But if you like to share, a very quick point, and we just quickly go through a room, and uh, it could just be like a phrase or a sentence. And you don't have to do it, but uh, it's nice to share. Then you know, we all students can know, like, okay, this point really stuck with him, and that's how I connected with him. So, okay. so another advantage of sharing is you will remember it. The chances of you remembering it are more likely. Yes. When we were, when we hear something, it's good. But when we speak it, it's like enters deeper into our brains. So knowledge generally flows deeper into us when it flows through us. Yeah. I have a question actually. Um, okay, can we just, uh, should we do the reflections quickly? Or? Should we do the reflections and then, you know, we'll have few time minutes. Uh, and then yeah. you can have, even you can come and personally ask questions. And let's just yeah. quickly go through them. So, who would like to start? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I really like the point where you said um, that, you know, as human beings, we're kind of um, mm -hmm. always fighting between, like, weakness and then like we're going like kind of forward and backwards um, towards either wickedness or towards virtuousness or virtuousness. Um, and if we try to um, have our intelligence controlling our mind, um, we will be going more towards the virtuousness. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I really like the point where you said that an untrained mind can be you know, your biggest enemy and a trained mind can be your you know, best friend. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes? I like what you said about um, living, you can live in the moment, but not for the moment. Um, I think that it speaks to the fact that you're allowed to jo enjoy your life as long as you have a, a purpose besides just the enjoyable moments of life. I think it's very applicable, especially in college. <laughs> yeah. So you, have a, you have a balance. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yes. One point to be like uh, yeah. Yeah. So, who told that like uh, that is when we like uh, take food or anything like eatable, we are really conscious that we should not uh, we should be careful. But when we use our like uh, visual senses, then that time we many times we don't think, but it is not uh, the same thing. So actually, through vision also we take lot of negative or positive impression based on the. Yes, for the mind to form impressions, whether something comes through the eyes or through the mouth or the skin doesn't matter. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Regarding enlightened joy and ignorant joy, as soon as you started speaking about it, I automatically knew like five things in each category that like apply to me in my life. And I have been thinking about it, but I just it simplified like this and visually it helps easier to understand. And a part of my life of cutting the ignorant joy and working more towards the mind. Good, thank you. Happy to be of service. And it's good to have something that we hear both vindicate and illuminate what you have been thinking. And this is what I've been thinking, and this makes it more clearer. It makes, uh, makes learning uh, synergistic with living. It's good, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I like the example of homepage, like the, the place of being this small becomes your homepage and then it comes to your consciousness. <laughs> yes, it's true. We all can actually introspect what is our homepage. <laughs> <laughs> we all have some homepage. And one way to find out what it is it is to check 
what we think of when we have nothing to do where do our thoughts gravitate towards that's our home page thank you nunels yeah um i was uh, really intrigued by um the inner screen the seer and the and the interface concept um could you just like retouch on that just so it kind of sticks firmly within me yeah inner screen is a very good metaphor to understand otherwise this concept can be a little abstract so do no, just elaborate this with the mind intelligence how that inner screen would work is that on the inner screen either we can see the initial nectar say of ignorant joys or we can see the eventual poison now if the mind is strong then if you can imagine if you consider the inner screen to be like a camera it can focus here or it can focus there so depend on who is stronger they'll focus on that direction now surprise if suppose somebody wants to take a selfie there's a group selfie and some person wants to be very prominent in the photo hey move it this way that person says move it this way then whoever is stronger the phone the phone gets angled in the direction so it's like that the inner screen what appears on it or what focuses on it what zooms out on it depends on the mind or the intelligence which is stronger thank you yeah okay so, so the uh, the poison and the nectar thing that really stuck out to me as well does that also apply uh apply to um discipline as well so say for example you see something you're like oh man that's got to be nectar but for for um it's got to be something that you have to discipline yourself with so you don't have to you know go through something that's so joyous so you can have that balance yeah discipline enables us to uh, choose whether we go for the initial nectar or we are ready to wait for the eventual nectar the initial nectar is of the ignorant joys so discipline is where we are ready to wait and it's not that we necessarily have to be disciplined about everything we can choose you know at least for the next one week next one month i'm going to do this one thing regularly mm-hmm. and if we try to be disciplined in every walk of life we'll just get overwhelmed right away choose one thing discipline ourselves in that and then carry on maybe continuing that thing or going to some other thing but discipline helps us to persevere through the initial poison till we get to the nectar in enlightened joys mm-hmm. that makes a lot of sense yeah <laughs> okay okay yes any other reflections okay so we we'll take one question and then you can yeah uh, yeah you talked a lot about how to bring yourself your own mind from weakness to wickedness to virtuousness how would you suggest going about uh applying that to somebody else or to see somebody else that you might really you still might really be close to somebody that you really feel love for but you see them walking down like uh like a path of of wickedness or or weakness especially with them with the like how can you kind of help them okay if it's somebody mm, whom we care for going along the direction of weakness or wickedness how can we help them <coughs> broadly speaking mm, change can happen either because of compulsion or inspiration mm. say somebody is working at a job and they just lethargic not doing any work and the boss comes and says you'll get fired if you don't work hey, i don't want to lose my job that's a compulsion so they might be spending a lot of time just randomly surfing on social media on the internet and not doing their work so sometimes compulsion is what uh or triggers change hmm. so but but compulsion is possible to apply only when there is something which the other person values that is at stake hmm. if say this person who is working at a job they feel anyway mm, i have social security if i don't work also the government will pay for me then i get lost i won't work so it, traditionally in society there were structures the family is a structure so when there are committed relationships in a family then the fear of the disruption of that structure was what disciplined people no so Uh, in some ways compulsion 
can help others if we know something is of great value to them and if that comes at stake eventually so but that's not a very positive motivation but sometimes that's what is required mm-hmm. but it depends whether we are in a kind of position where we have that relationship with them like say parents when they discipline their child you know if they do or don't do something and say okay now you can't drive your car or you can't have your phone or whatever but that is usually possible to do if we are in a position of authority and that person is subordinate up to a particular age but beyond that what we can do is inspiration generally the door to personal change cannot be opened except from inside once it is even slightly opened from inside we can push and help them to open it bigger but it can't be broken by banging from outside so sometimes mm sometimes if somebody is uh, going on a really bad track and despite our best efforts they are not changing then the best thing that we can do is stop protecting them from the consequences of their actions mm. i was uh, last year when i had come to america i had gone to a to the con- in connecticut they had invited me to speak on mental health and spirituality so it, it, there was addiction so there was one person who came and talk with me and he said that this is just one story but there many stories like this this was like a, almost like a 60 year old man and he had a small 5 year old girl with him and he said this is my granddaughter so this is my da- daughter who started taking drugs and then i was trying to help her as much as possible as much but then she just kept doing it again and again and once she left her her daughter alone at home and there was some kind of electric wiring that went wrong and she came to my house and stole my life savings and went away and that electric wiring triggered some fire and her daughter was all, almost on the verge of dying in that fire and then somehow the neighbor saw something they called 911 and the daughter was saved so at that time i decided that you know i cannot in any way support her so he said I had a I registered I complained against the police so she was arrested and she was sent sent to a de addiction center and I filed for custody and I mean if she comes out she's not going to get the custody of her daughter back the custody is going to be with me and when that happened a daughter hated him how you are taking my daughter away from me what kind of father are you sending me to jail but now she has come back to senses so slowly now she's trying to recover so there is an addiction there is something called codependency where the partner or the relative of the uh, of the addict keeps picking up the pieces after every episode of the addict and they think that oh i am doing so much for this person this person is so so irresponsible and i am doing so much for them but the other person doesn't appreciate it at all and keeps re- repeating worsening also so sometimes the best thing that we can do for someone is to stop shielding them from the consequences of their actions when the consequences hit them that's when they are jolted of course that's the worst case scenario and a more positive level we can one human being can influence another human being in broadly three ways i use the word 3e for it enlightenment engagement and encouragement enlightenment means that not in the metaphysical sense of some state of light but enlightenment simply means we help them see the consequences of their actions not just tell them don't do this this is bad maybe if somebody is going on a particular track get them to meet someone who has ended up in a, in in distress and despair down the road where they are going so both kind of things sometimes we need to confront um, how bad we we may become so that we can commit to how good we can become so enlightenment means helping people see the consequences of their actions like I, the same diagram uh, the nectar will lead to poison eventually and present it in terms that they understand not just like moral directions don't do this but uh, say don't tell me sh- don't sh- don't tell me show me so it's like even a graphic way that could be demonstrated engagement means but in general every unhealthy craving is a distorted expression of a healthy need 
every unhealthy craving is a distorted expression of a healthy need. <coughs> Some people might drink because they, are, um, they might be alcoholics, but or they might be drinking and they might sometimes drink a lot also, but they might just be social drinkers. They just want to belong to a group. Now, if they get into a group where people don't drink so much, they will stop drinking. For them, their need was not alcohol per se, was a sense of belonging. So, if that need is addressed, then for them it is easier to give that up. For somebody else, say, uh, for them, say, drinking is a way of uh, escaping from life's distresses. Then, no matter if that, if they need a healthy escape way from life's distresses, now that can come through music, that can come through reading, that can come through meditation, that can come through mindfulness. But what is the need that is there? If we can understand that, sometimes we just let the other person lower their guards and in a non-judgmental way hear them speak. They might also be able to figure out by speaking with us. Listening helps a lot in thinking. If somebody has a person is eager to listen and they can think, speaker can also think. Then if we can understand their need, then engagement means providing them a way by which their need can be fulfilled. And third is encouragement. Encouragement means, uh, suppose somebody is oscillating between say weakness and virtuousness. Sometimes what happens? We catch people when they do wrong. So somebody is, uh, is a, somebody has behaved well for one week and on eighth day they have a relapse. You will never improve. You, al you always say you will change and you again fall back to the same old thing. But instead, appreciate them for the seven days. And of course, the eight-day relapsing is an issue. But is, uh, people don't just need uh, to be shown the right way. People also need to feel that I can go in that right way. So encouragement comes generally by, mm, I have a whole seminar on parenting about this, but you know, parents, those who appreciate their children for what they achieve, those children don't develop intrinsic self-worth. Because they feel my parents will love me only when I achieve something. If I don't achieve it, my parents won't love me. On the other hand, the parents appreciate how the children strive. You know, in a disciplined way, you studied for this semester, you that was good. Now sometimes they get good grades, sometimes they don't get good. They matter, but they don't matter so much. So if you focus on uh, how people strive and appreciate them for that, that is in their control. So if we can, encouragement means affirming the intrinsic self-worth of a person. You are not your bad habit. You are separate from your bad habit. You are here, your bad habit is here. I have issues with your bad habit, but I am here with you. And every time you want to wrestle with this, I am here on this side to strengthen you. So when we offer encouragement in that way, then definitely we can become an agent for or a catalyst for helping them to change. Okay. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Chaitanya.